Good morning. Welcome to Saturday Morning Scripture. My name is Larry Pittman, and today we are going to talk about uh, love in a nutshell. We, uh, we're going to start a, we're starting a new series today uh, on relationships. And so today we're going to focus on the topic of love in general, and then get specifically about the love um, that God talks about. And then we're going to go on to talk about uh, marriage, a uh, little bit about uh, premarital affairs and uh, parent and uh, child relationships and uh, brotherly and sisterly relationships. So I want to cover relationships in general um, over the next few weeks. It might be three, four messages long. I'm not quite sure about that. Um, but today we're going to uh, talk about our foundation, which is love. Let me share this. with a certain group, and then we'll be started. Glad you could make it here this morning. Welcome. Today we're going to talk about love. And if you feel led to participate, to say hi, or to um, ask a question, or to engage me, feel free. I see the comments, and I like to engage. I like participation. If you want to say an amen, that's great. If you want to say, whoa, Larry, I don't know what you mean by that, or uh, I, don't think, I think you're wrong, um, feel free to chime in. I'm all about engagement, participation. I'd rather uh, know that I'm talking to someone than just people that, you know, I have no idea whether they're interested or not. I'd rather you be interested in watching. Um, so uh, chime in. And so today we're going to talk about love. We're going to talk about specifically the love of Scripture, the love in the Bible. And uh, when Jesus says to love one another, when Jesus says to love him, um, what exactly does he mean by that? Um, and I, I don't want any confusion because love is a very confused uh, word these days in our culture. We love pizza and we love girls and we love, uh, you know, our mom right? All three of those things, just as an example, they don't mean the same things. Um, love is not the same kind of love as other love. <laughs> so I can understand the confusion. Um, and we're going to clear that up. So good morning, Cheryl. Welcome. Glad you could join me. Uh, before we... Okay, so uh, our, our new series that starts today is on relationships. And so beyond this message of love I went again to marriage um, and into you know pre-marriage uh, discussion a little bit to help people so that they might um, have an idea of of you know the biblical perspective of marriage and because uh, premarital counseling I think is very important and um, I've I've done a little bit of that at, as a lay counselor and I want to share what I know about uh, premarital counseling and marriage in general, because I am married. I've been married for 26 years. And um, and so I want to talk about that. I want to talk about uh, brotherly, sisterly love. And I want to talk about parent-child uh, relationships as well. So what the Bible has to add to all that, to the, the conversation. So I hope um, you'll be with me. Is that This is a, an enjoyable topic for me. I enjoy talking about these things, of course. Um, so let's go to God in prayer and uh, lift this up to him. Father, we praise you. We thank you so much. Lord, you're so good to us. 
And we thank you for watching over us. We thank you for all that you provide for us. Thank you for keeping us safe. And thank you, Lord, for your word that blesses us immensely. That we know truth. That we gain knowledge and understanding. Help us to learn today as we sit at your feet, Lord. Help us to learn what your word has to say on this topic of love. And uh, open our hearts and help me to deliver uh, this message. Um, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome. Good morning, Mom. Welcome. Glad you could join me this morning. Okay, so it's about relationships. Love is our foundation is the first uh, message of this series. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, we're going to get into that. So love is our foundation. Um, we are nothing if we do not love. Love must be our focus. And there's much to say about this. Let's get right into it. If you were able to print out the uh, handout, um, and if you can't, I understand. Uh, I want to go first to 1 John 4. 1 John 4. Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. That is such a powerful passage. I could talk about this passage probably all day. Um, I love that last verse. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. In other words, if we're not loving, and I'm going to show this, um, this is going to be mentioned again, this concept of People won't know God unless they see love in us. He says, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. So in other words, the only way people are going to see God through us is if we love, is if, we, if his love remains in us. So in other words, that's what makes this so foundational. If we don't love, God can't, uh, people won't see God. Um, all they'll see is noise. All they'll see is a, a clanging gong, as, as we'll read a little bit later. So for a discussion today, and so I just wanted to lay that, those, that passage out there just to help us understand the, the, uh, the magnitude of what it means to love and the importance of it. Uh, verse 8, the one who does not love does not know God because God is love. It's like, geez, if we get one thing right, it's love. And that, you know, that should be our highest focus, our highest uh, goal. Um, so there are many, mainly four different Greek words that translate to the word love. So in the Greek language, and I've seen as many as eight uh, Greek words that also can translate to love. We're only going to focus on four. Um, what's most popular today in our culture is eros. So eros love, and you can probably figure out if you haven't heard this already, is the Greek word for sensual or romantic love. 
The term originated from the mythological Greek god of love, sexual desire, physical attraction, and physical love. Eros, whose Roman counterpart was Cupid. Okay, so it's this giddy, twitterpated kind of idea. Not not necessarily twitterpated, because um, I think I think those those first impulses of loving someone might not be all uh, erotic, of course, because um, there's a you know there's a transition there as your relationship grows. So I'm not going to get into that into the science. I'm not an expert in that. All I'm saying is the eros way of love between you know a man and a woman is uh is not what is not the same love as what we just read about in first john 4. <clears throat> so let's continue um the next word for love is storge it's uh spelled s-t-o-r-g-e it's another greek word for love the this greek word describes family love the affectionate bond that develops naturally between parents and children and brothers and sisters. So, you know, as you love your best friend, because he's your best friend, um, that is not the same kind of love as you might have for your mom and dad or for your brother or sister, right? So Storge is like a familial love, like for your family. And so that that's what you know, it's different. It's just a different kind of love. And that's all I can say. I mean, I, I hope you can understand that. And then we have philia love. And this is the type of intimate love in the Bible that most Christians practice toward each other. This Greek term describes the powerful emotional bond seen in deep friendships. So this is um, an example of this in scripture is Romans 12, verse 10, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. So this is a love that a, a, a woman might have with another sister, a sister in Christ. And it's a love that cannot be described in any other way, but, you know, a love that I think God gives us for, for our brothers and sisters. Um, and uh and it's it's still um not the same love that john describes in first john 4 that we read so um again it's a different kind of love this is a love for brothers and sisters in christ that they have this you know brotherly love and and i i don't know i think others even not christians can enjoy the philia kind of love uh you know, brothers in arms, those that fight and serve together, and women that serve together in certain capacities develop a certain bond. And that's not, um, that's still not the same love, you know, as, as 1 John 4, but it's still a filial kind of love where it's a, it's a brotherhood. Logan? Honey, I can't have you making any noise. What are you, you going to do in here? I need, I'm doing a video live. Your sister should be watching you. Can you go out there? We're going to need you to leave, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you uh, for... Now I need to get back. So, uh... So saying that uh, the phileo type love, I think, can be experienced also outside of uh, the Christian uh, walk without being in Christ. I think God can uh, work in those relationships that that we have with other people in that in that way. So our love that we want to focus on today is God's love. And that's the love that God has for us. So when we say God loves us, it's it's greater than the Eros love, obviously. And that's why, you know, with uh, with Jesus, you know, people want to make him out to be a regular man. So they think, well, 
you know, maybe he had a certain kind of love for Mary Magdalene or, you know, it can be perverted. Um, but he, he had no need for love at that level because he, he's, he's God in, in, a, in, a, in a body, um, in the flesh. So, um, and then the Storge love um, is for family and, and uh, you know, Jesus probably experienced that love with his, with his mother um, and his brothers. And then, and, and, you know, maybe uh, with um, Mary and Martha. And then the Philea love, he certainly probably did experience that love. But the love he had for us that made him willing to die on the cross for us is not any of those other loves. It's, it's agape. Agape is the love that is um, the focus of our discussion today. And this is where we need to live as Christians in this agape love. This is how we need to love others. Um, and it goes beyond all those other loves we talked about. The highest of the four types of love in the Bible. This term defines God's immeasurable, incom incomparable love for humankind. It is the divine love that comes from God. Agape love is perfect, unconditional, sacrificial, and pure. And of course, John 3.16 is, uh, is one use of this word for uh, love. And it says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So that's the, one of the greatest examples of that word love. He agapes us. <laughs> So, um, you know, that's why this, this uh, word love is so confusing because people throw it out for, you know, I, I love um, cars. You know, I love to go shopping. I love my work. And it, 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 it pales in comparison to what God is leading us to, to live our lives with when it comes to loving him and loving one another. And so I'm not... You know, I, I'm not saying don't use it. I'm just saying it's what makes it confusing when people uh, throw the word love around. They, don't, they, you know, they they don't necessarily understand what they're saying. Um, so, C.S. Lewis writes in his book The Four Loves that agape is the highest form of love known to humanity, calling it a selfless love that is felt for the well-being of others. And it's just being happy for other people. It's being happy without um, needing to be happy ourselves. It's kind of a love of contentment. And the, uh, the I cited my source. Some of this I didn't write. And it's on the, the sheet here. It's uh, learnreligions.com, just to give them the credit of, of taking those definitions. So let's move on. So. Let's focus now on the greatest commandments, because um, if, I, I firmly believe if we focus on these greatest commandments, you know, everything else will fall into place. It's almost like when you say, uh, you know, Matthew six thirty three, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all the things will, you know, will, will be given unto you. Um, so Jesus is telling us to focus on on these things. Matthew twenty two verse 34 when the pharisees heard that he had silenced the sadducees they came together and one of them an expert in the law asked the question to test him teacher which command in the law is the greatest he said to him love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind this is the greatest command greatest and most important command the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself all the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. So that's why this is foundational. The, the, the uh, focus that John gives us there in 1 John 4, that we, you know, we don't know love, we don't know God. Um, and here we're, we're called, we're commanded to love. Uh, love is a decision. There's a great book, by the way, that helped me understand love a lot more. It's called Love is a Decision. And I think it's Gary Smalley wrote that book, I believe. Love is a Decision. 
and it helps you understand this. We're commanded to love. And so, uh, frankly, we're commanded to do something we're unable to do in ourself. And we're going to talk about that. Because how on earth um, can we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul in our own power? We can't. So he's, he's commanding us to do something that we can't do in our own power. And we'll get into that exactly how, you know, that works out. How on earth can you do something when you know you can't do it in your own power? Um, we'll discuss that. So, and then I want to hit the golden rule, which is, I think, one of the real most basic things, very practical to know um, how to love other people. Uh, he said to him, no, 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 Matthew 12, Matthew 7, 12. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Matthew 7, verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. Again, um, he puts the greatest commandments and says, uh, all the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. And in Matthew 7, 12, he says, this is the law and the prophets. Um, in, in the NLT, it says, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. Uh, this is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. So that golden rule is, is a reason why it's always been called the golden rule. Because when you, you know, treat others, you know, you got to think, would, would you want that done to you? If you think about yelling to your child, now, if he's running out in the street, yell at your child. <laughs> but when you, you know, when you want to get angry and yell at someone, think first, would I want them to yell at me in the same way? Um, anyway, um, we need to put some thought into how we treat others. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time in the Old Testament talking about... Um, uh, the love of God. And there's just four verses I have here where I want to talk about um, what the Old Testament has to say about God. So I think um, when we when we consider love ourselves, we need to uh, understand where our love is coming from and where it needs to come from. And I think the greater appreciation we have of the God we worship of the God we serve and want to model after, the greater we know his character, uh, the more we can, it, it kind of expands our minds to understand, um, you know, as he loves us and how great his love is, um, we, we should become more like him. So in other words, uh, our reputation as a lover, as a lover of souls, as a lover of people, should grow over time and it's only after spending time in the presence of the lord um and and it's it's a supernatural thing and it's something that develops over time after spending time on your knees in prayer uh and 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 so it's 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 he it's it's that fruit and we're going to talk about the fruit <clears throat> in a little bit so let's go to psalm 63 verse 3 your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I love that. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. Psalm 103, verse 13. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Psalm 86, verse 5. You, Lord, are forgiving and good abounding in love to all who call to you. Psalm 107, verse 8, Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. And so it's good to um, remind ourselves how great God's love is. And I'll tell you why. It's because when we live in a culture where few good things are actually said about God, he's maligned, he's, he's uh, 
uh, misquoted and and people don't have great things to say about God but when you read the Bible it, it gives you truth of what who God really is and we all need to be reminded of that and so um, you know the, the 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 closer we become the closer we come to Jesus Christ in spirit um, and in our walk with him um, the 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 more his love is magnified so that's why i preach all the time we need to be in the word of god because we need that reinforced daily and it's it's part of remaining in him which we'll talk about in a little bit so love is greater than knowledge this is a, a real key fact and truth that we need to understand today love is greater than knowledge in first corinthians 13 verse 8 Paul says, now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. In other words, the more you know, um, and you know, the more knowledge you have and accumulate, it, it, it puffs you up and it, it, it leads you to be uh, arrogant because you know so much stuff. And so... That's that's not what we should be seeking, um, because we don't you know we don't want that. <clears throat> we need love because love builds you up. Um, and so, knowledge should not be our focus, and that's exactly what he says in First uh, Corinthians thirteen. And that's why I think uh, our our churches um, are. I, I think when the focus is on, you know, just knowledge, you know, knowledge of the word and, and not, you know, love, <laughs> loving one another, if, if we don't, if we don't somehow translate that knowledge or allow it to be practical in order, to, in an effort to love each other, then it's misapplied. In other words, we can learn all the Greek words that the pastor knows and um, and understand, you know, all this stuff. I've heard people just be amazed at, um, you know, teaching, and that's great. But if it doesn't translate to how how that can help me love God more or, or love, I mean, it's good to have an appreciation of these things. Um, but sometimes I think... Um, it kind of misses the boat a little bit. It misses the point of what God wants us to, to do and to know. Um, so let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. I love this because to me, it really defines love specifically. And love is even greater than this chapter. But this chapter, I think, helps us to um, have a greater grasp of this agape love. 1 Corinthians 13, and, and one thing I, kind of a pet peeve of mine, is is my my uh, experience with uh, with um, this chapter is is it's usually relegated to marriage, and it is appropriate to use it in marriage. However, it's it's not specifically for marriage. It's for everybody. It's for our basic. Uh, living on this planet with other people. Um, so that's, again, one of those things where love is is kind of uh, relegated in our culture to marriage. But we need to love our our friends, our neighbors, and everyone else. So this, this definition of love should apply to everything in general, not just a man and wife. So 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions, and if I give over my body in order to boast, 
but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but when I, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And I tack on uh, chapter 14, verse 1, let love be your highest goal. Because we know that they didn't write in chapters. It was just one uh, scroll. So I just include that because I think it's appropriate. Love, love, be your highest goal. Um, so basically how I take this is our our maturity as a Christian is is based on the love we have for others. That's our That's the mark of a mature Christian. It's not how much he knows. It's not how much Greek, Hebrew or how many uh, spiritual gifts they have, whether they can speak in tongues or whether they can uh, prophesy. Um, our, our measure of maturity is love. As he sums up there, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, a reason like a child. You know, became a man, put, put aside childish things. And um, this is about growing up, being mature. Um, so these things remain faith, hope, and love. In other words, the spiritual gifts, the knowledge will no longer be necessary when, when the perfect comes. When the perfect comes, he says in verse 10, the partial will come to an end. And what goes beyond is faith, hope, and love. And the greatest is love. So faith is good, hope is good, but love is something um, that is the greatest. So... Love is a first fruit. Let's go to Galatians 5, verses 23, 20, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Okay, so love is that first uh, fruit. And I think it's a first fruit in, in, in the way of, uh, you know, when we're patient with someone, it's it's out of our love. All these other fruits kind of come out of, if you want to think about love being a branch, all those other fruits come out of that. And, and you know, self-control is, is, is being about, um, you know, we, we want to please God with our bodies. So self-control in however way we exercise self-control, it's out of love for God. So it's a part of love. All those fruits come, they like stem out of love. And so uh, how do we get this fruit? So this fruit is something that comes from us. But again, as I shared earlier in the year uh, about bearing fruit, um, it's not something we can do on our own. You can't produce your own fruit. You can't make yourself love people greater. You can't make yourself have greater compassion. You can't make yourself um, be a better person. You, I've learned that um, love only comes from being 
in Jesus and remaining in him. And I'll, I'll explain that here. It's very clear here in John 15. So in other words, um, for all your loving acts that you've performed in the past, um, all the quote unquote good things you've done, um, I'm sorry, but you can't take credit for it because uh, uh, Jesus gave you the capability of doing that. And if you did it out of a, uh, a selfish motivation, well, that's not really love at all. Um, so in other words, uh, any, anything good we do for other people, we need to give that credit to God. Let me read John 15, verses 5 through 8. I've read this so many times. Uh, uh, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. So we prove to be his disciples by remaining in God. And we uh, bear fruit because we remain in God. So uh, apart from him, we can do nothing. So we need to understand that um, spending time with Jesus, remaining in him. And I, I take that to at least three activities. The three activities the Spirit has led me to, to understand. And that is reading the word of God. And, you know, you read that through his spirit. You don't just read it as you pick up, you know, a technical journal or a novel. Um, you read the scripture through the spirit of God. So you read scripture in a way it's prayerfully. Help me to understand this. And so we, we soak up that truth and that knowledge builds us up. And so it helps us to understand God more. And then we, we pray to him, um, whether it be, you know, uh, uh, giving thanks or or praise or praying for other people or praying for yourself, um, which is completely understandable. So we, you know, through that prayer, we remain in him. And then when we fellowship, when we when we have meaningful uh, discussions with other people and talk, you know, include. Jesus and the scriptures, that's another way of remaining in him. So, you know, we're, to, we're supposed to pray without ceasing. So as you go about your day, as you drive around, you pray for God's safety, you pray for God to lead you, you pray for God to, you know, lead you to have meaningful conversation with people that you know, because you know that they need Christ. You know that they need love. You know that they need attention. You know that they need someone to help them in whatever situation. So you want to be an ambassador of God all throughout your day. So um, you should go about that prayerfully. Lord, lead me, help me to say what you have me say, that kind of thing. So um, that is about remaining in Christ, which we need to be. And when we do that, we will, we will bear much fruit. So it comes out of spending time in his presence. Um, John 13, verses 34, 35. I give you a new command, love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. So in other words, uh, people don't know we're disciples because of all the doctrine we know. People don't know we uh, are Christians because we go to church, just because we went to church. Um, people know we are Christ's disciples because we love. And that's why people, so many people hate Christians today because because some people that profess to be Christians at least, they, they talk about all this doctrine and they know this all about God, but yet they don't say it in a loving manner at all. In fact, they can be very arrogant about it. So we need to be loving and uh, don't be quick to share everything you know. Because they don't, they don't really care what you know. But if you love them, 
they will eventually care what you know. And then they will invite you to talk about what you know, rather than unsolicited uh, knowledge, which no one, no one typically likes unsolicited knowledge. Um, let's go on to John 15, verse 9. So this continues from we, what we read. We read 5 through 8. This is John 15, verse 9. It continues. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So here he is on the night before he knows he's going to have to suffer and die. That later that night, he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's telling them, love others as I have loved you. Um, and he's about to lay down his own life. And actually, from his first ministry, he's been laying down his life. He's been giving of his time, of the power that he had in him to heal and to teach. Um, and so... As Jesus loved us, we need to love, and that is an impossible thing for us to do. We just can't do it on our own. We need his love to give to others. We cannot give to other people what we don't have. So we need to be in the presence of God, spending time in his word, spending time in prayer. And I mean pray wholeheartedly. Give of yourself to God in prayer. And I've just been reading a book for those of you that want to pray more. I know, Mom, you've mentioned that before, that you want to pray more. It's a book about intercessory prayer, and it's really helping me um, do that. And so um, we need to be in that prayer, spending time with Jesus. And the more you do that, the more you want to do it. It's, all, it's, like, it's, it's the same thing I've been saying for years about reading the Word of God. The more you read the Word of God and the more... Uh, it gets in you the more you want to read it. It just it, it just becomes alive and you want to understand it more. And, he, and you do. He, he, it builds up. It grows. And so um, and so is prayer. The more you pray, the more you want to pray. And I've known that to be true. So this is where we need to be. We need to be in, in prayer and reading. Um, and other other activities in our life pale in comparison. Now I'm going to go to John 17, and we're going to wrap up soon. John 17, verse 20, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me, so that they might may be made completely one, that the world may know you have sent me and have loved me as you have loved me. Okay, so this is a call for oneness. This is Jesus' final uh, prayer before leaving the upper room and going to the uh, garden of Gethsemane, and here he um, makes it very ab abundantly clear. If you read the whole chapter of John 17, he's talking about um, uh, being one with God, and we become one with God when, we, when we're when prayer, and when we pray with one another, we become one with them. When you meet another believer out there, and you get this connection that you know they follow Christ, and you're a Christ follower, you have this connection. You become one with them. So Cheryl says your life should be a prayer. Absolutely, it, it should. Jesus was in constant prayer. And so, uh, and, and, and he, he prayed and he fasted. And, um, and people could see that he did the works of God. And so it is with us. The more time we spend in prayer and in the word, 
the more we will know, will be known to be his disciples. So we must worship in spirit and truth. And spirit and truth is, is being understanding the truth and knowing it. And uh, worshiping in, in spirit is all about being in prayer. It's a prayer-filled life. Um, thank you, Cheryl, for adding that. So love conquers fear. 1 John 4, back to that chapter, what we started. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. We love because he first loved us. So any fear we have doesn't come from God. Um, it, it, it comes from the world or from the devil. Um, and so when we love God, we, you know, cast out all fear. Don't, don't worry about anything. Be not afraid. So when we, we live in that love of God and remain in him, the less and less fear we'll have. And then I'm going to wrap it up with one more passage to hammer down uh, the importance of this love. And this is Paul's prayer for the people of uh, Ephesus in his letter to the Ephesians. Um, this is Paul's prayer, and, and I think it's God's intention for us. I think whatever prayers uh, Paul prayed for the churches, they're meant for us um, because we read them personally and as if as if those letters. Now, not everything uh, in those letters necessarily to reply, apply to us, but generally speaking, they do. Um, Ephesians 3, 16 through 19, um, he says, I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's like, wow, you can't get much better than that. Um, he's praying for us that we be rooted and firmly established in love. And again, in verse 19, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge right so again love is greater than knowledge love is greater than doctrine so in other words uh to speak on that um as i've said many times we have little unity in the in in the church we didn't have unity in in any given uh local one congregation let alone you know among the denominations and it's all because we've put doctrine ahead of love. We think that, you know, when we start talking to someone, you know, we might say, hey, are you a brother? Yeah, well, you know, you're a Pentecostal. And then all of a sudden you start to talk, focus on your differences. And you, you, there's no unity when you focus on your differences. And these differences aren't, aren't, um, aren't anything essential to Christ's love. Right. So when you just focus on that basic element of Christ's love, you won't you won't have differences. Um, you'll you'll just have a camaraderie. And guys, um, if you want to see unity, join our Bible uh, calls on Monday evenings where we gather and we don't talk about uh, denominations. Um, every once in a while, we'll get into differences of opinion. But um, we, we basically stick to what the scripture says and we, we, we share our thoughts and we might disagree, but ultimately we, we have unity on that call because, you know, people are from all, all kinds of backgrounds and, and denominations, which we don't, we don't talk about. We talk about the word of God and we talk about, you know, what it means, but um, there's a spirit of unity there. And so I'd love to see that in, in the general church today. And that's, it's awful when we are segregated 
by the very words that are supposed to bring us together. So uh, our, our church needs to repent. You know, the American church needs to um, put love before doctrine. And it's, uh, it's just awful uh, what we see today. And the church isn't very attractive because we, we spend so much time bickering amongst each other that, of course, we're not recognized as Christ's disciples because we're focused more on what we know and what we don't know than, than, than loving one another and, and uh, loving people that differ in, in uh, opinions than us. So, guys, uh, if you have any prayer requests, go ahead and uh, state them there. I can pray for that. And I'll pray us out right now. And uh, if you have anything to share, I'll, I'll, I'll pray. Um, and then we'll pass in it uh, next week. We'll get into marriage and that relationship and what the Bible has to say about marriage and all knowing that, you know, the love we're to have for other people is, is what we talked about today. So this is uh, something to set the tone for the whole series. So uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we praise you. We thank you so much for your love that you loved us first so that we might love you in return. Lord, your love is so great. It's so magnificent, Lord. We can't even comprehend your love for us. And Father, we, we long to know you more, to know your love so that we might love uh, others. Help us to do the work you've called us to do. Help us to make disciples. Help us to love others uh, and not seeking anything in return. A selfless love, Lord, as you have given us. Help us to remain in you through prayer, through reading of the word, and through fellowship. Lord, help us to do uh, uh, what you've called us to do and, and, and be loved because you are love, Lord, that we might be loved as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for sharing this time with me. God bless you. Have a great week.